next autumn, the French are ready to invade Iroquois territory once again. This time, they assemble a massive force, 600 soldiers, 600 Canadian militia, and 100 Indians. When they reach the Iroquois villages south of the Great Lakes, the warriors have already fled. The French then issue a grim warning of what the five nations of the Iroquois can expect if the war continues. No battles are fought, but the Scorched Earth campaign is a triumph for New France. There is certainly something extraordinary in this whole business. For if the Iroquois had held their ground, they would have made much trouble. But this route has reduced them to the most desperate humiliation. A strange victory it may have been, but cause for celebration all the same. The French show of force convinces the Iroquois to sign a peace treaty that will last for 20 years. Since the king has had the kindness to extend his care to this country by sending the regiment of Carignan, we have witnessed great changes in Canada. And we can say that it is no longer the country of frost and horror that people used to talk about as a disgrace, but it is now a true new France. The soldiers now expect to return to France, but Louis XIV has other plans. He offers large estates, seigneuries to officers who will remain in New France, and smaller plots of land to the ordinary soldiers. 400 take up the offer, including Pierre de Sorel, Antoine Picotet de Contrecourt, and François Jarret de Verchet. The fur trade outpost is becoming a new society. of French soldiers in Quebec that makes the summer of 1665 memorable. There are all sorts of marvelous new sights, signs of new hope. On the 16th of July, the ships have arrived, bringing some horses, with which the king intends to supply this country. Our savages, who had never seen any, viewed them with admiration and were astonished that the moose of France, for so they named them, were so tractable and so obedient to man's every wish. One of the new arrivals is Jean Talon, the king's intendant. His job is to administer and build up the colony. Monsieur Talon made it evident to us at the outset that the king loves this country and has great plans for its development. By his personal qualities, he makes us already taste the sweetness of a governance so guided by reason. In Versailles, King Louis XIV has decided on an important role for his colony on the St. Lawrence. Louis is only 27 years old, but he dreams of being the most powerful monarch on earth, dominating the great powers of Europe, Holland, England, Spain, and Portugal. He launches a commercial war against them on every continent, including North America. Jean-Baptiste Colbert is the mastermind. The king has formed companies which, like armies, attack them everywhere. And as the major part of this commerce involves our colonies abroad, we believe it is necessary to maintain, protect, and reinforce those which are already established. Talon is Colbert's man in New France. A month after arriving, he already realizes that this out-of-the-way little colony can be very useful. I believe that Canada has never been looked upon as it should be. In 15 years, there will be enough overabundance to supply the West Indies. I don't say this lightly, and I express this opinion after having closely examined the strength of the Earth. Just one thing is missing. People.
was baptized at Saint-Gervais de Paris and raised by my mother until I was 13 in the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. I had to flee to escape from the rages of my own brother, who no longer respected in me the sacred rights of nature, religion, or the law. For one so young, Marie-Claude Chamois has known terrible sadness. She was born to a well-off Paris family, but fled her home in 1669. Her first place of refuge was the Salpetriere Hospital, a shelter for abandoned women, poor children, and the mentally ill. A year later, her life is turned upside down once more. I was chosen to join a number of others who were to go to America, and I preferred to renounce my homeland and take a perilous voyage to a new world rather than beg my mother's help. I resigned myself to silence, far from my own country, without friends, without help, without parents, condemned to a perpetual exile. by a group of other girls, Marie-Claude Chamois leaves France in 1670 for the New World. In all, 1,000 young women are sent to New France at the king's expense over a period of seven years. They are poor, abandoned, with no future in France. People call them les filles du roi, the king's daughters. The hundred girls sent over by the king this year have only just arrived and already they're almost all accommodated. He will send another 200 next year and even more in the years following. It is an amazing thing to see how the country is becoming populated and multiplying. Soon after her arrival, Marie-Claude Chamois marries François Frigon, known as the Spaniard. She is 14 years old. Isabelle Huppert marries Louis Balduc of the Carignan Salière Regiment. Anne Perrault marries Pierre Blais. In 1665, the seigneury of Neuville near Quebec was virtually uninhabited. Two years later, 40 newly married couples live there, including 37 filles du roi. There are rumors that some of the girls have been prostitutes in France, but Pierre Boucher insists otherwise. It is not true that this sort of women come here, and those who say this are greatly mistaken. If by chance there are a few who come who are discovered or during the crossing behaved badly, they are sent back to France. It is hard to live a scandalous life in such a small colony. What these young women have in common is their poverty and their fertility. Jean Talon takes extraordinary steps to encourage them to bear children. All inhabitants having 10 living children born of a lawful marriage will be paid a pension of 300 pounds a year, and for those having 12, 400 pounds. Furthermore, all boys who will marry at the age of 20 years or less, and to girls of 16 years and less, will be paid 20 pounds each on their wedding day. Marie-Claude Chamois and Francois Frigon now live at Bascon, close to Quebec. They eventually have seven children, the ancestors of every Frigon in North America. <laughs> <laughs> 